Uh, <coughs> I think we should begin now uh, because all the panels are so exciting and it would be a pity to miss time for discussion, although there are interesting discussions during the coffee break as well. Um, hello, I'm Małgorzata Bakir and this is my pleasure and honor to chair this uh, panel that is dealing with uh, discourses on nuclear, global and environ environmental crisis. And our first uh, speaker will be Ardak Oragbayeva. Uh, she is a first year master's student at the Faculty of Oriental Studies at the University of Warsaw. She is a member of the scientific club Human Rights and Humanitarian Crisis at the Faculty of Political Science and International Studies of the University of Warsaw. And her research topics are the history of the Soviet Union, modern Russia, dissidents, migration, various crises in the history of mankind and authoritarian uh, regimes. And she will be talking about uh, what um, what the former semi-Palatinsk uh, nuclear test site is silent about. And please, the floor is yours now. Thank you. And how I can use... Um, I think it's there, the presenter. Uh, I would like to greet everyone and to thank the organizers of the conference uh, for your efforts and uh, give opportunity for us to present our presentation of very sensitive and important uh, topics. In my presentation, uh, I will talk about the place where I was born. This is the east of Kazakhstan, Central Asia. On the first side, you can see a painting of an artist who was also uh, was born in the Simpalatinsk uh, region. Uh, I will demonstrate his work, um, his works on the theme which is related to the nuclear uh, threat to humanity several times in my presentation. His name is uh, Karibek uh, Kuyukov. Uh, now he lives in the central part of Kazakhstan, in the city of Karaganda. Also, he is activist of the international anti-nuclear movement. Paintings by Karabek Kuyukov are exhibited in private and public collections in USA, Japan and Germany. He has exhibited in Japan, USA, Germany, Turkey, China and uh, Kazakhstan. For more than uh, 30 years, the former Simple Items nuclear test site has been silent, but the consequences have remained. Okay. Uh, this slide shows important dates uh, related to the simple Latin's nuclear test site. Uh, the construction of the nuclear test site was started in 1947 in accordance uh, with the secret decree of the Council of Ministers of the USR, dated April 21st of the same year, called Questions of the Mining Station, object number 905. As the director of the Institute of Nuclear Physics, academician Chasnikov uh, said in his book Echo of Nuclear Explosions, the harmful effect of radiation on a person leaves its traces forever. To this day, the mortality rate of the population from oncological diseases and various anomalies is high in this region. The Soviet atomic project began in 1942. Two, after the, intelligence, the Soviet intelligence received the first information about the work of the United States and Great Britain on the use of nuclear energy for military purposes. On the September on 28th of the same year, Stalin signed uh, an order on the organization of work on uranium. The news of the American bombing of Jam of Japan accelerated Soviet researchers and the military. Since 1945, uh, the main stage of the USSR's work on nuclear weapons uh, began. On the scientific uh, side, Igor Kurchatov, uh, called like uh, the Soviet Open Gamer, became the head of the atomic project. On the part of the state, the project was supervised by uh, Lavrin Tiberia. The construction of the test site in Simple Latin's region, uh, now it calls like a by region uh, from the, uh, this region uh, gave the new name last year was started on August 21, 1947. 
the choice of the uh, site for the nuclear test site uh, was due to the fact that according to engineers, no more than 200 people lived within a radius of 100 kilometers from uh, it. The red shows you on the map the territory of St. Platin's nuclear test site. On, this, uh, on the north of this red, you can see the city of Kurchatov, named after the scientist Igor Kurchatov. Uh, in the Soviet Union time, it was top secret uh, city. And even now, if you are, want to visit this uh, territory of Kurchatov city, if you are foreigners, you need to get uh, permission from uh, Kazakhstan to visit this place. Uh, meanwhile, 1 million and 40 and 500 million people lived in the Sinopolitan region with a land of more than uh, 300,000 uh, square kilometers. Territory equal to Germany, Italy and Poland together. The first nuclear explosion in the Kazakh steppe occurred on August 29, 1949. It was a ground test on a special installation with a height of about 30 meters, the explosion had a power of 22 kilotons, and the blast wave reached up to five kilometers. It uh, seems uh, to estimate the power of the bomb uh, dropped on the city of Nagasaki from 90 to 21 kilotons. Thus began the nuclear arms uh, race between the USR and the USA. Uh, Kazakhstan land with a total uh, area of more than uh, 90,000 square, square kilometers, comparable in size to countries such as Slovenia or Israel, has become a field of scientist experiments and part of the world race of nuclear weapons between the USR and the USA. At the same time, few people thought about the danger to, feel, uh, to which the local population was uh, exposed by this politically motivated scientific research. More than one million people became victims of the test in the simple like nuclear test site. Many of them received irreparable harm this led to malignant tumors, radiation sickness, and diseases of the nervous system. Uh, these explosions of, at the Simplatius nuclear test site were usually carried out on uh, windless days and taking into account the wind direction. People were not informed that another explosion was coming. Residents of the East Kazakhstan region, Simplatius, Pavlodar, Karaganda regions, learned about the explosion only by the movement of the terrain of the earth. Uh, we can say that they were used ex as experimental animals. Uh, the results of human exposure were received by the employers of the Simpolatinsk nuclear test site through the regional point, which was uh, kept secret uh, here. Uh, in uh, 1953, an explosion occurred from a new weapon of even greater power, a thermonuclear hydrogen bomb was tested. Its main developer was Andrei Sakharov, a well-known dissident in Soviet Union and Nobel uh, Peace Prize winner in the future, who advocated a complete uh, cessation of nuclear testing. The second uh, test of thermonuclear bomb conducted in 1955 became even more destructive. The power of the RDS-37 thermonuclear bomb was one and uh, six megatons in um, tent uh, equivalent, uh, 70 times more than the first nuclear bomb. By this time, Sakharov and some doctors began to guess about the effects of radiation on DNA. That the mutations received from radiation will be transmitted to the children of the victims causing hereditary diseases. Scientists also did not that the radiation affects heredity and causes mutation in DNA because they didn't know understand the nature of DNA itself. Its structure was discovered only in 1953 and the genetic code discovered in 1961. As the first uh, negligence of the Symbolite's nuclear test sites, management could still be explained, among other things, but by ignorance of the possible consequences. The military and scientists themselves took uh, risks uh, underestimating the threat. However, when uh, Soviet doctors began to find significant evidence of the presence of radiation sickness in local residents, the military was practically not interested. The reports of doctors and scientists from the Kazakh um, uh, sir, in Moscow, we were considered a mistake uh, that hindered the development of the military power of the Soviet Union. In 1959, a special commission of the USR Ministry of Health arrived in Kazakhstan from Moscow to conduct research on the impact of nuclear explosions on the health of residents of adjacent settlements. The conclusion was extremely cynical. The received dose of radiation from the test in the simple nuclear test site was not fatal. 
the data on the research results of the USR Minister of uh, Health was were classified and only years were became uh, known to Kazakhstani doctors after the official closure of the Simplatis nuclear test site. After the Caribbean crisis, mass anti-war movements began to emerge and governments of different states made uh, concessions to society. Against this background, on August uh, 5, 5th, 1963, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons Tests in the Atmosphere, Outer Space and Underwater was signed in Moscow. The leaders of the USR, USA and the UK decided to come to the rejection of nuclear tests in stages. So it was possible to resolve this issue with the registration of underground explosions. The concluded uh, contract prohibited all tests except underground. It was believed that the underground once caused less damage to the ecosystem, but this is not the case. The particles released during the explosion didn't uh, go anyway. They remained in the ground or went outside. Uh, on February uh, 12, uh, 1989, the emergency release of radioactive gases uh, to the Earth's surface occurred after another underground test. A cloud of gases covered the village of Shahan, located 40 kilometers from the explosion site. The 79th Strategic Aviation Division of Soviet Union, independent of the training ground, was stationed there. The limiters of the division recorded an excess of radiation background up to 3,500 to uh, 4,000 microradians per hour, which exceeded the norm by 200 times. Um, the division commander mayor, General Pavel uh, Bredichin, concerned about the consequences of the test of the, for the population, informed the first secretary of the St. Palatine's Regional Party Committee, Kishrim Bostaev. Uh, the next day, Kishrim Bostaev, having agreed to visit uh, with the then chairman uh, of the Council of Ministers of Kazakh SR, Nusultan Nazarbayev, sent a telegram under the healing top secret to Moscow to the general secretary of the uh, CPSU, Mikhail Gorbachev, demanding a rejection uh, in the frequency and power explosions and the transfer of tests to another place, followed by the termination of tests at, sim at the simple items test site. Uh, this event was the impetus for the creation of anti-nuclear movement, which was headed by the chairman of the Union of Writers of Kazakhstan, public figure and poet uh, Oljas uh, Suleymanov. In the live television speech on February 26, 1989, he made a statement about the need to stop nuclear tests in Kazakhstan. Oljas Suleymanov recalled, it was such a special time I called uh, in the moment of democracy which suddenly came at the end of the 20th century in the USR. After that time, thousands of people flooded to the regional party committed with the appeals demanding that the nuclear test site be closed in Kazakhstan. This was also demanded by the participants of the scientific and practical conference, where for the first time the public was presented with documents on the terrible consequences of nuclear tests. The impact on the environment and public health um, exacerbation of chronic diseases, stress, increased morbidi morbidity, child maternal and general mortality. The relevant ministers and departments knew about all this, but they actively developing the activities of nuclear test site didn't care at all about helping the population. On uh, February 28, 19. Uh, 89, at a demonstration near the building of Writers' Union in Almata, Kazakhstan, it was decided to create an, the anti-nuclear movement uh, Nevada Himipalatinsk, later Nevada Himi. It was officially registered in ap April 1989. Uh, at the in initiative of the movement, the Supreme Soviet uh, of the USR adopted an, an appeal to the USA Congress calling for a dialogue at the parliamentary level or ending the test. The movement organized numerous protests, uh, action, demonstration, and uh, peace uh, lessons. In the early July 1989, Olja Suleymanov spoke at the Congress of People's Deputies of the Supreme Soviet of the USR, where he reported on the goals and requirements of the anti-nuclear movements created in Kazakhstan. A few days later, together with journalists, and he visited a Simpolatinsk training ground. So the military town of Kurchatov was declassified. On October uh, 4th, 1989, after an explosion at a 60 kiloton nuclear charge test site, a demonstration was held outside the Minister of Defense building in Moscow. 130,000 miners of Karaganda, 
spoke in support of the anti-nuclear movement. At these uh, demonstrations, uh, they said that if there were further explosions, they would arrange an uh, indefinite strike, uh, which would be supported by workers from all over Kazakhstan. Also on November uh, 14, 1989, the Supreme Soviet of the Kazakh SSR issued an appeal to the government and people's deputies of the USSR with an urgent request for the immediate cessation of nuclear explosions. On October 19, uh, 1989, an explosion with capacity of 75 kilotons was made on the territory of the simple Latin test site, which became the last. It resulted uh, in numerous uh, demonstrations in Moscow, Almata, Karaganda, Pavodar, simple Latin city, and the village of Karaul of the Abai uh, region, at which demands were, were made for the closure of the simple Latin nuclear test site. On October 23, uh, 1989, Olja Sulemenov in his speech at the session of the Supreme Council based on the fact that the government didn't keep promises to reduce the number of and power of explosions, announced a national moratorium when any subsequent test would cause a general strike in Kazakhstan. At the end of October of the same year, at the session of Supreme Soviet on, of the USSR, Olja Sulemenov and academician Andrei Sakharov put forward a proposal to declare an uh, unilateral a um, indefinite moratorium of nuclear explosion by USSR. On November uh, 14, 1989, uh, the Supreme Soviet of the Kazakh SSR adopted a resolution on the harmful consequences of testing and the impact on public health and the appeal to the Supreme Soviet uh, and the government of the Soviet Union demanding the closure of nuclear test site in St. Polytinsk. On May 22, 1990, the Supreme Council of the Republic adopted a resolution on the closure of St. Platin's test uh, site. On August uh, 29, 1991, decree number 409 of the President of Kazakhstan, Nurstan Nazarbayev, on the closure of St. Platin's nuclear test site was signed. Thanks to the broad uh, popular support in 1989, the movement managed to stop 11 explosions at the Simpalatin's test site out of the plane uh, 18. Olja Sulemenov said, this is how we used the moment of democracy. But however, the government has been considering this, this, this is you for a long time, until August 1991. And you can see uh, the next slides uh, contain um, photos which I uh, made uh, in September of this year in Semi City, formerly na name of the city Simplatinsk. Uh, it is a decree of the President of Kazakhstan about closure of Simplatins test site in the park on Semi City on two languages, on Kazakh and Russian. Uh, there you see monument stronger than death in Simpala in Simei City. You can uh, see this uh, mother with child, and uh, she tried to protect uh, the child from a nuclear explosion. On December second, uh, twenty o nine, the at the sixty uh, fourth session, it of the UN General Assembly on the initiative of Kazakhstan, a, re a resolution was uh, anonymously adopted, declaring August 29 the International Day of Action Against a Nucleus Test. The resolution was, uh, it should be noted that after the close of St. Palatin's nuclear test site, the young state Kazakhstan got a huge territory with injected lands of tens of thousands of square kilometers with destroyed infrastructure. Uh, but even uh, 30 years uh, after the closure, the simple uh, nuclear test site continues to have a negative impact uh, on human health and the environment. A nuclear test site may pose a danger for at least another million years, given that the activity of plutonium radiation decreases by half every 24,000 years. And this means that the danger of, to the health of future generations of Kazakhstanis remains. Uh, residents of East Kazakhstan region uh, note that the first version of the law 
named uh, on social protection of citizens affected by nuclear tests, it's in Palatine's nuclear test site, adopted in the early years of independence uh, of Kazakhstan, had more points on benefits and privileges than in the current version of the law. According to the Scientific Research Institute of Radiation Medicine and Ecology of the Minister of Health of Kazakhstan, about 1 million and 400,000 million people uh, on the territory of Kazakhstan affected by the test at the St. Palatine's nuclear test site. However, there are still no effective social uh, support measures and decent comp or compensation in the country. This opinion is shared not only by the victims themselves, but also by public figures. The current laws was adopted in the early 90s. Then, according to lawyers, the so-called rulemaking process was not developed as it is now. The law, uh, they say, uh, has long been outdated and contains many contradictions. According to official data, in, the in 2021, the number of new cases of cancer in Kazakhstan increased by 25-30% and reached uh, 36,000. The leader in this sad statistic is not only the same Palatinsk region, now is a by region, but also the neighboring regions. Doctors also note that the cancer has noticeably reju uh, rejuvenated. Okay. Uh, Anthony Butts' documentary about the surf consequences of the explosions at St. Platin's nuclear test site attracted the attention of Western society. The director says that the film After the Apocalypse was released widely in the UK. Every 323rd resident of London watched it. He wants to draw attention to the fact that even now, um, at that time, uh, 20 years after the cessation of nuclear tests, every 20th child in the region exposed of radiation is born defective. Um, and I want uh, to end my presentation with the painting of Karibek uh, Kuyukov. Um, and uh, you need to know that Karibek Kuyukov uh, paints with the help uh, of lips and toes. Uh, he was born without both hands as a result of radiation exposure to which his parents were subjected during tests with Palatine's nuclear test site. In 2013, Karibek Kuyukov was refused an entry visa to the UK to travel to the conference on nuclear dis disarmament in Edinburgh on the grounds that he had not submitted fingerprints. Later, representatives of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Great Britain reported that there was a misunderstanding during the paperwork and assured that a visa would be issued to Mr. Kuyukov uh, soon. In 20, um, in uh, 2016, President of Kazakhstan, Stan Nazarbayev, presented a painting of Kuyukov to USA President Barack Obama during the Nuclear Security uh, Summit. And the last site uh, is containing the work of uh, Pasha Kass. It is a very famous street artist from Kazakhstan, but now he's living in Berlin, Germany. And uh, thank you for your attention. It is all from me. Thank you very much, Ardak. And uh, our next speaker will be Alexandra Pulvermacher. Hello. Uh, she conducts research at the Institute of History at the University of Klagenfurt. She is currently involved in a project on anti-Semitism uh, at the University of Salzburg. In March 2023, uh, she completed her PhD on a comparison of Soviet and the German suppression of Polish resistance in occupied Poland uh, between 1939 and 1941. Uh, she is the author of several scholarly papers, including early deportations of Jews in occupied Poland in October 19. Uh, 39 June 1940, or Action Zamość and its entanglements with the Holocaust. Uh, in December 2023, her conceptual article, Poland and, uh, under German and Soviet rule 1939-41, Approaches to and Comparison, will be published in the Journal of East Central European Studies. Uh, 
Mm, she was also a fellow at the Center for Holocaust Studies at the Institute for Contemporary History in Munich and during the summer school Polygia as Landscape of Intervention. Uh, she was uh, intensively uh, tackling the topics of nuclear power and the nuclear disaster uh, in Chernobyl. Uh, during the two-day stay in Varaz near Rivne, she visited the nuclear power plant sim uh, simulator as well as the local nuclear power plant. And she will be talking now about uh, the Chernobyl disaster, individual memories of people directly affected. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to ask the. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here, and of course for the organization of this great uh, conference. And today, I would like to memorize uh, this great disaster. I also memorized it. I was six and a half years old, and I was told not to go outside, not play, to play in the sand, uh, to clean my shoes. But today, I would like to concentrate on the individual memories of people there in the uh, region of Pripyat um, who were living there and also were brought there to work as liquidators. I basically uh, concentrate on interviews, um, mainly on the book of Alexievich. Uh, Svetlana Alexievich is a novelist, uh, oral historian. Uh, she is uh, from Belarus. Uh, her book was already mentioned uh, on Wednesday, and I think she did a really great job in this book. Uh, I'm sure um, conducting these interviews was also traumatizing for her. Uh, very much, and it's no easy reading. Uh, then I also um, concentrate on a four-part documentary of the second German um, television. It's called Chernobyl, die Katastrophe. Um, I recommend it. <laughs> and uh, I also found some interviews in the internet. Uh, first, I would like to start with uh, memories of Nikolai Steinberg. He uh, was the chief nuclear engineer at Chernobyl. He came to the Chernobyl region very early uh, when the reactors were still constructed. They also constructed uh, the city of Pripyat. It's a Atomograd. Um, they built very beautiful flats um, yeah, for Soviet relations and actually this city was uh, perceived as a kind of a paradise in the Soviet Union. Uh, young people there, many families with children, uh, and uh, yeah, the husbands, mainly the husbands, were working in the power plant. And um, the problem was um, the Ministry of Media Machine Building, uh, which was responsible for uh, um, this whole uh, industry for atomic power plants, but also for atomic bombs, they um, constructed um, this RBMK-1000 uh, reactor, uh, which was of a problematic design. Uh, but it had two advantages. On the one hand, it was easy to build, even in the Pripyat swamps. And on the other side, it was uh, producing really a huge amount of electricity. And the, uh, the Soviet Union was in a crisis in the middle of the Cold War, uh, and it needed, it really needed this uh, electricity because Ukraine was a very hungry country, hungry of electricity for this industry, for example, in the Donbass. But uh, this Chernobyl um, plant um, actually produced electricity for Kiev, which was very close to uh, this power plant. And um, Nikolai Steinberg was only 24 years old, and he knew this uh, reactor only from plans, so he was sent to Leningrad. There was another such reactor, there he got instructed. And one time he um, remembers there was an incident uh, when um, there was something going really wrong. Pressure tubes bursting, uh, uh, radioactivity um, leaking. Uh, so there was a big problem. The problem was he and other people who were not of the core personnel, they had to leave. So when he returned after two weeks, nobody told them what had happened. So um, that's the problem with the so-called Sretmarsch, also this ministry, um, that everything was very secret. And... Um, yeah, he later worked then in Chernobyl. They uh, uh, had these first reactors. 
working and also there were big problems with the reactor 2 for example and um, Nikolai um, placed criticism the only way was to tell the Pervaya Utilenia the first department which was actually the KGB um, and in fact in 1983 the KGB uh, wrote a report for the Kremlin and warned, warned of uh, the, uh, these reactors, these RBMK reactors in Leningrad, Kursk and Chernobyl and told that they are dangerous. But the Soviet Union or the regime uh, didn't want to uh, stop uh, them working because they were so important. Um, Nikol Nikolai Steinberg was uh, sent to a different um, power plant and uh, yeah, the channel will, uh, was working um, until the 25th of April. Then uh, they actually started this test run. This test run was nothing special because um, it was a standard procedure uh, to test the emergency power system. And the problem was this test uh, got out of control due to the positive void effect, uh, which was probably already experienced in Leningrad. But the Sretmarsh uh, had not told anything about that, so um, these guys in Chernobyl didn't know about it. And uh, there was then a chain reaction, and uh, yeah, finally the reactor, in, uh, so the reac reactor 4 exploded, and uh, extremely high radiation uh, was released. Uh, and the problem was the people there working in this contra control uh, center, they couldn't believe it because these reactors, they were not supposed to explode. So it took quite some time that they could realize this and to, uh, that they informed uh, Moscow. And um, yeah, Moscow, <laughs> the Kremlin um, was used to cover up such things. Like uh, in 1957, there was for, uh, this Kishtim uh, disaster in Chelyabinsk. Um, in this case, they couldn't cover it up completely. It was too close to the west. And in Sweden, uh, at Forsmark, uh, actually they found out that there is uh, way too high radiation and asked uh, the Kremlin uh, what's going on. First they got no answer, but uh, there uh, Gorbachev was already um, conducting discussions because he actually was against this usual procedure of covering up. So uh, on the 28th of April, uh, there was a short task message where uh, they wrote uh, in four lines, there was uh, an accident and they are already working on it, uh, but not much more. And uh, the big problem was that uh, only until the end of May, eight tons of radioactive fallout was spread into the atmosphere and was uh, spread to northern uh, Europe and other parts. Um, yeah, the first uh, memory, uh, or actually the second already, uh, is of a doctor, um, Paulina Serliuk. She lived in Kiev, worked in Kiev, and she uh, was brought with other doctors to the um, Chernobyl uh, region. Uh, she didn't know actually where they were to go. She had no idea what they would do and what would uh, await them. And um, they did not get any protection. And so she came to uh, the region. They um, were sent to a hospital 40 kilometers from the reactor. And uh, they were supposed to uh, take care of the uh, local population and also of liquidators. She stayed there only one week um, and what she remembers was this metallic taste, a very strong metallic taste and helicopters flying in the air. So uh, very strange. Um, and she also mentioned that a dosio dosiometrist, uh, a radiation doctor was with them. That was unusual. And um, yeah, only one year later, she uh, got cancer, she became an invalid, and uh, later she uh, was able to go to Germany as a quota refugee, as she had uh, also Jewish roots. And uh, at the time of the um, interview in 2017, she was living in Koblenz. I don't know if she's still alive. She uh, was already a little older. Um, then 
as, but she was really devoted to her work. I think that's also very interesting that many of these people were very devoted uh, uh, to their um, work. Like also uh, Vasil Ignatenko, here on his wedding photo, and the memory is of his wife, um, Ludmilla. Uh, she was uh, pregnant at the time of the disaster. Her husband was sent to the um, plant to fight the fire. He was a fire fighter and uh, didn't return. And after seven hours, um, Ludmilla got the information that he is in the hospital. Uh, she went there, but the hospital was cordoned off by policemen. Um, these policemen, but also people from the staff of the plant were sent to Moscow to a special hospital, number six, which uh, was specialized on radiation sickness. Of course, Vasil had uh, gotten a deathly doses of radiation. Uh, and um, Ludmilla went to Moscow and she bribed uh, the guards of the hospital. She lied to the medical staff, didn't tell about her pregnancy, and uh, she finally uh, was able to take care of her husband. Uh, but they told her, be careful, he is a reactor of himself, actually. It's dangerous to be so close to him. She didn't care. Um, he uh, died on May 13th, um, and a really very terrible, terrible death. Uh, so Chernobyl death meant, uh, in this case, a disintegration of the body. Uh, this radiation destroyed everything inside and outside. So um, there was also no funeral because uh, his body was put uh, in his clothes. F f shoes wouldn't fit. Um, they put it in a plastic bag, then in a coffin, then in another zinc coffin, and finally they put all these coffins under a concrete plate on a cemetery in Moscow. Uh, this all was very traumatizing. Um, Ludmilla got her baby, Natasha, uh, who uh, died four hours later because of a heart defect and uh, cirrhosis of her liver. Because she had taken all the radiation, she had saved uh, Ludmilla's life, but Ludmilla uh, also suffered a stroke and uh, she, she got a baby later. She also had, a, um, so a, I think, a depression and uh, was very sick um, when she was only 30 years old and also her second child uh, was suffering. Um, then uh, the memory of Oleksiy Preuss. Uh, it's interesting because I met him on my summer school. We talked to him at the um, museum in uh, Kiev. Um, and he worked actually on the reactor four, and he was on the morning shift on this 26th of April. He went there with the bus, realized that the reactor had gone. He was like um, there going. There were all these graphite parts laying around. It was a real a big shock, but and I think that's also very important to uh, realize all these people, he and 3,000 other workers, they went there, they worked there nevertheless because they had such a high uh, sense of duty, uh, though they knew that they uh, risked uh, their own health by doing so. So uh, the order from Moscow was to cool the reactor, which is normally very important in an atomic power plant. In this case, it was problem problematic because there was no reactor left. So uh, they, uh, in fact, flooded the basement uh, and thus also the electronics. So they caused a lot of damage um, in this way. Uh, then uh, the memories of Maria and Natasha Prozenko uh, are interesting because Maria Prozenko was the leading architect uh, in uh, Pripyat and she designed all the houses. Pripyat was a beautiful city um, as there was a lot of place. Everybody got a flat that was not usual in the Soviet Union and um, also her daughter who was 15 at this time, told that it was like in paradise. There was uh, this Pripyat river where they were swimming, there were also these nice surroundings, uh, a great infrastructure, uh, very unusual for Soviet uh, relations. And um, yeah, and until this very day when everything actually changed. Um, 
yeah, also Maria was very devoted to her work. She um, uh, organized later also the evacuation of Pripyat, but the problem was that it was conducted way too late. They waited 36 hours, and this um, city of Pripyat was very close to um, the reactor, only four kilometers. And people, they were not realizing, they were not informed. There were people even who, who were working in the plant, they were standing on their balconies and looking with the little children to the reactor because it was glowing so beautifully. <laughs> and uh, they, were, um, yeah, they got all this uh, radiation and uh, the problem also was the weather was beautiful uh, during this day and uh, there were weddings going on. Everybody was outside. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, they got a huge radiation. Um, Maria's son and husband, uh, they worked as liquidators and at the time of the interview, they were not alive anymore. Uh, concerning this um, evacuations, uh, they were conducted chaotically. The first town was Pripyat, then also other uh, cities and other places were evacuated. That took quite some time, I think until the uh, beginning of the millennium even, and uh, more than 300,000 people were uh, actually um, evacuated, some, uh, or most of them uh, then to the region of Kiev, but some even several times because this radiation levels changed. Um, and there in this region, um, they, they had a lot of liquidators, uh, 600 to 800,000 of them. Some had to demolish uh, the buildings and to remove the top of the layer um, and, and uh, all this um, waste was put into pits, uh, the so-called Mogilniki, um, which were robbed later. So robbery was a big problem and thus they spread all this red radioactivity all over the country, actually. Um, another crime was uh, that they did not cancel the first May parade. Um, tens of thousands of people, uh, thousands of children, uh, actually were exposed to really dangerous high radiation, for example in Kiev. And um, yeah, functionaries were even forced, there was put pressure on them to participate. I have one memory of uh, a man, uh, a functionary of Slavgorod, who told that he forced his own daughter, who was pregnant, to go there. And in the meantime, she gave birth and the his grandchild uh, got cancer, uh, leukemia, so uh, he uh, also seemed very depressed in his interview. And uh, this actually is one of the factors which made people in the Soviet Union really angry uh, at the system and which became later a catalyst for uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, then uh, memories of former chief scientists are very interesting because they had the knowledge. Uh, there was one Vasil Nestarenka. He was working at the Institute of Nuclear Energy at the Academy of Science in Minsk. And he really tried very hard to warn uh, the Communist Committee in Minsk because um, in Ukraine, they, they, made, uh, they conducted some measures, but in Belarus, which was uh, also harmed very much of this radiation, uh, even worse actually, uh, there they did nothing, they ignored it completely. And uh, yeah, also uh, Vasil Nestarenka was ignored later, he was even threatened, he wrote a letter to Moscow, he, uh, for this, he was brought to trial for anti-Soviet incitement. He even suffered a heart attack um, as um, he, um, uh, yeah, he couldn't do anything uh, to, to change the situation. Uh, and then there's also Marat Kochanov. He's the director of this institute. He um, remembers that he got food samples of this area and indeed uh, it was radioactive waste, he, he told. Um, he even went uh, to the zone with some colleagues and they made measurements uh, of the thyroids uh, of people but also of food and he, yeah, he told that um, actually all these collective farms in the region, they did not stop working, they produced millions of tons of grain, which was fed to fat stock. They produced milk and meat, and this milk and meat was added to non-contaminated uh, food. 
and this food was sold all over the Soviet Union except Moscow and Leningrad. Uh, so everybody got some radiation in the Soviet Union. So, and uh, even when they were conducting these measurements, like here in the photo uh, below, um, they were not supposed to tell the population. They, they were not allowed to warn them. So they told them everything is okay, but they knew that uh, these measures were, were way too high. Um, and uh, he told of one incident when uh, his female colleague saw a baby playing in the sand naked. Uh, she, she had a nervous breakdown when she saw that. So it was really uh, very traumatizing also for the scientists. Um, yeah, to get to the conclusion, um, the disaster could have been prevented if the threat marsh would have informed people in Chernobyl about the positive void effect. Um, what is very interesting is this high sense of duty that uh, people there really felt it necessary to work as liquidators um, and also to stay at the plant. Um, but this was not afford, uh, or, or there was no... Um, yeah, actually, actually the, it was a very terrible disaster management from uh, the Kremlin. It, it was really uh, uh, most terribly done uh, because uh, they did not try to save any lives or to prevent uh, health problems. Um, actually the opposite, but at the same time uh, tried the KGB to interrogate uh, people, even these uh, people who were in this hospital in Moscow uh, who were dying, uh, in order to find scapegoats for this disaster. Um, and they had actually a trial then later in Pripyat. Uh, they tried to cover up, and this was more important than uh, saving lives. Uh, but this is something we see also now in Russia. Uh, if you think of the meat grinder at the front, uh, it's actually very similar, in my opinion. Um, in these uh, memories, we see this suffering, um, this stigmatization, because they were people of Chernobyl. Many people had problems later, liquidators, young men who wanted to marry somebody, but were, were told, no, I cannot marry you, you are from Chernobyl, I cannot have children with you. So many of them were referring to the Second World War. They said it, it's actually a, a war of its own, but uh, the difference was uh, after Second World War, the Soviet people were winners, they were enthusiastic, they could build up again everything. In Chernobyl it was different, there were no winners, the, the, the war didn't stop and they are still suffering, there was no recognition and actually um, it caused a huge loss of confidence into the regime and this became a catalyst for the demise of the Soviet Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexandra. And we need to move quickly on to our next speaker, who is Ina Hakinen, and she will be uh, presenting online. I hope that everything is settled and that Ina is already awaiting us. Is that true? OK. Uh, then uh, Ina is a visiting uh, researcher of Helsinki Environmental Humanities Hub, uh, the Department of Cultures at the University of Helsinki. Uh, today she is a fellow of the Institute of Advanced uh, Studies Kusak uh, in Hungary. Her current project is focused on researching the literary dimensions of nuclear energy within energy literary narrative studies. She coordinates and co-teaches Chernobyl Studies course, as well as nuclear narratives in East Central Europe at the University of Helsinki. Uh, after de defending her PhD in literary studies in Dnipro, Ukraine, uh, she has been a research fellow at numerous places and institutions in Bologna, Turku, Cambridge, uh, Ohio, Warsaw, and uh, Iwaskila. I am sorry for my Finnish pronunciation. 
um, uh, she is among the contributors uh, of the Rutledge Handbook of Ecocriticism and Environmental Communication. And her general research interests are envi environmental humanities, energy humanities, petrocultures, ecocriticism, nuclear criticism, literary energy narrative studies, world energy literature, uh, nuclear fiction and Chernobyl fiction, energy ethics. Uh, she is also a member of the Association for Literary Urban Studies, uh, Helsus and Nordic Association for American Studies. Uh, hello, uh, Ina, it is good to see you. And Ina will be speaking about envisioning uh, Tira trauma within resilience studies, reframing the turnable in nuclear fiction for young adults. Uh, for uh, this kind of uh, uh, introduction, as, uh, uh -huh. uh, as well as uh, thank you, organizers, for this chance to be online speakers. Uh, yes, I am a member of. Do you hear me? Uh -huh. uh, just uh, please uh, feel free to interrupt me in case my presentation is frozen or something wrong technically with my presentation uh, and uh, or if I am over time. Um, just years. Uh, I am a member of Helsinki Environmental Humanities Hub and by visiting uh, the uh, pages of our Helsinki Environmental Humanities Hub in social media. You can see activities which we organize together with our team. Uh, and nowadays we are conducting Helsinki Environmental Humanities Month. A lot of event, uh, events are online and it is possible to join them. And within this, um, uh, within our hub, it is energy and humanities sessions are of my responsibilities. Uh, and nowadays I am, um, just nowadays I am in Kursik in uh, Hungary at the Institute of Advanced Studies, and it is seven kilometers from the border with Austria. Uh, and in case you need a very calm uh, place for productive research, I encourage uh, I encourage um, those who are interested in, the, uh, in that uh, to apply for a fellowship here. Uh, just and because I remember the deadline is um, the deadline for applying for this fellowship uh, is in the mid of December. That's why I highly recommend, just highly recommend, uh, recommended place for conducting the research. Uh, okay, let me switch to my presentation. Uh, the Anthropocene calls for new narratives and the literary perspectives on energy storytelling helps to distinguish such energy-related uh, fictional writings, writings as petrofiction, uh, carbon fiction, hydrofiction, climate fiction, Anthropocene fiction, nuclear fiction, and actually it is nuclear fiction which is in the focus of my research. Yes, actually this research, um, this presentation is within um, just is within my research interest on uh, um, emoting nuclear energy within literary energy narrative frames. Um, and uh, where I am trying to investigate the narrative tools of emoting nuclear energy in nuclear fiction within the focus on comparative narrative analysis of storytelling nuclear energy, nuclear power uh, in North American and Eastern Central European uh, European literary practices within the nuclear Anthropocene rhetorics. Uh -huh. As I have just mentioned, it is nuclear fiction, which is uh, in the focus of my research, and actually Chernobyl fiction, uh, which is regarded as a fictional storytelling on nuclear energy, uh, on nuclear energy related issues, uh, which can be, uh, which contributes to, sh to shaping nuclear cultures via nuclear narratives, uh, and defines the, and helps to define the nuclear energy as a so yes, as a debatable but social, uh, but social value. Some words about the theoretical frames of my research. What influences uh, my research? Uh, my um, research. First of all, it is uh, such little critical, uh, um, literary critical fields as nuclear criticism, um, initiated by the most debatable statement of Derrida that any nuclear event is a phenomenon whose essential feature is um, of being 
being fabulously textual. As he said, we can uh, or we can only um, talk and uh, write about uh, event. It is uh, any nuclear event. It is uh, it is a non event. And this statement is still uh, is still under debates within the nuclear criti uh, critical or um, uh, scholars as well. New new uh, new nuclear uh, criticism. Then uh, uh, just my research is under influence of the geocritical studies regarded literature as a source of environmental knowledge. Uh, uh, also energy humanities, especially literary and energy narrative studies. But the mo but for this presentation, it is mo the most important is eco-critical um, eco critical and uh, uh, intermediate eco-critical criticism. Uh, which influenced uh, my research. And just actually, it is uh, um, environmental um, intermediate eco -criti uh, criticism developed by Jurgen Brun in um, Linux University, uh, Linux University, where he and his team developed the project on intermediate eco criticism, and uh, he, together with his team, stem from the statement promoted by Urs Ursula Hayes about the importance of amalgamating the, crit uh, the scientific study of the nature, the scholarly, uh, scholarly analysis of uh, cultural representation, and the political studies for more sustainable ways of inhabiting the natural world. Yes, emphasizing the steps uh, towards uh, towards um, personalizing and emotionalizing knowledge. Uh, they say that if the communication of scientific facts uh, uh, should have some impact, the facts need uh, need to be personalized or even emotionalized or even given a concrete meaning that is that is relevant to for the everyday life of the citizen uh, citizen uh, citizens. Uh, for this, uh, for researching the literary perspective on emotion the nuclear powers, and in particular, it is the uh, Chernobyl disaster, intermediate eco-criticism appears to be productive and even necessary, uh, necessary uh, in studying the links between science, society, and environment, where we can, uh, uh, when we can deal with the literary and cultural dimensions of energy and energetic resources. Um, uh, in this presentation, or uh, in this presentation, I am appealing to these novels written by the North American writers and covering the uh, Chernobyl disaster-related events in more or less way. But the literary perspectives of situating Chernobyl nuclear power plant explosion and its aftermath um, are in the focus of this uh, fictional writing. The right, uh, the uh, these writers distinguish their novels. As, um, uh, uh, as children fiction or young adult or, uh, fiction uh, only um, just in their uh, interviews or uh, in their uh, in their um, description of this uh, of these novels uh, only James Reich in the bombshell he doesn't distinguish the, uh, uh, distinguish his novel as a uh, as a um, children fiction but um, uh, while speaking, or just but after I uh, got his permission, I received his permission to uh, to say that that part where he uh, where uh, his protagonist Varius Kakesh. Um, uh, reflects your child, your birth, the uh, details of your birth and your child uh, and your children and your um, childhood within the uh, near the uh, Chernobyl uh, Chernobyl nuclear power plant vicinity. That part can be regarded uh, as the uh, just can be regarded as the. Uh, uh, as a fictional writing for young adults, but even all the novel is devoted to the nuclear uh, nuclear terrorism. Okay, uh -huh. and uh, Karen uh, uh, and Phoenix Rising by Karen Hess. She also uh, just even the um, even the uh, storytelling uh, the uh, the um, uh, storyline represents the disaster of the. Um, the nuclear disaster and if, uh, its aftermath within the North American context, but the writer in her interviews, in her um, in her um, comments, she said that actually she used the fiction, uh, the factual, uh, the factual information on the Chernobyl disaster, but uh, but decided to put it in the uh, within the um, North American context.
Uh, just um, even the, uh, all these novels cover the fict uh, factual component of the nuclear history, uh, in, in particular the Chernobyl disaster. But in their comments, introduction, interviews, the writers highlight the fictionality of, uh, their, uh, of their writing. Uh, okay. Um, if it is the literary dimensions of the relations uh, of the relations uh, of the human and radiation contaminated environment there, that are in the focus of the study, then it is uh, terror trauma, which describes the trauma, distre uh, dis uh, distress of experiencing environmental change, the environmental disaster, uh, which is a key concept of uh, understanding the uh, of understanding the relations between the uh, between the human and uh, the environment with uh, environment uh, actually it uh, radiation contaminated environment and uh, this notion was launched by uh, Australian uh, philosopher Glenn Elbrecht but he des uh, he describes he, uh, he uh, reconsiders this notion within uh, your, such other key word key notions as um, euteria which is its adoration to the nature as well as uh, solastalgia uh, which is regarded as the um, um, just which is regarded as you can see some definitions as the uh, um, distressed or, uh, distress of environmental changes but in comparison of nostalgia which is characterized by temporal and uh, spatial dimension celestalgia can be uh, can be regarded only uh, just it is a pain distress uh, experiencing the environmental change but only within the uh, temporal um, uh, within the spatial dimensions Okay, but what happens to terror trauma, um, refer, uh, referring to distress of environmental changes when we deal with uh, uh, planting, gardening, and cultural activities in narrating nuclear disaster and its aftermath? And its aftermath. Uh, which factors contribute to switching uh, from uh, terror trauma to, to, uh, to euteria and then to celestalgia, defining the links between human and ecosystem as a whole? and resulting from the cumulative, uh, cumulative uh, impacts of environmental change on mental, physical, and uh, spiritual health. Yes, in these novels, we can see that at the first stage of... Uh, Sorry, uh, that at the stage at the first stage of nuclear explosions, uh, uh, explosion after mass, the environment change leads to the uh, having distress resulted from the deforestation, uh, buried forest, soil destruction, ruined environment, biodiversity loss, pollution resulting uh, in experience and celestalgia. Along with sadness related to degraded landscapes and worries about uh, losing the valued aspects of place, clean air and water, and scenery, the protagonist experience the range of emotions like fear, uncertainty um, related to the forced displacement and the, uh, and the collapse of their value paradigm, uh, paradigm having the social and political background. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, all the protagonists, all the protagonists of these novels, physically and in their reflections, they come back to the zone, to the exclusion zone, legally or illegally, for different reasons. Uh, to check their own dwelling place, to write a journal article, to find out their family roots, to uh, distinguish their uh, identity, to go through experience in the nuclear event and clarify their uh, spiritual changes, or just to uh, live there after uh, after failing to start a new life in a dwelling place after forced uh, displacement. And what they see, it is the abundant wild nature in a new dwelling place in a abundant, uh, abundant wild nature with uh, flourishing forest and visible uh, clean uh, rivers, contaminated area, uh, um, rather than being complete, uh, rather than being completely in uninhabited, the establishment and maintenance of the radiation contaminated area, the exclusion zone results in the surrounding um, surrounding ecosystem flourishing. Um, 
in this uh, in their reflections or in their physical activities they try to uh, and a part of these reflections and physical um, activities within their uh, within the um, uh, radiation contaminated uh, zone or, um, the focus is uh, by these writers is made on the uh, agricultural activities in this concern Mm -hmm. In this concern, they appeal to covering the indigenous planting practices and enhancement of uh, agricultural activities becomes to be a component of profiling survival lesson of the nuke experience communities within the uh, radiation uh, contaminated zone or nearby nuclear power plant area. The attempt of having access to clean non-radiation uh, uh, contaminated food resulted from the domestic agricultural activities as they are described here, planting, gardening, gardening watering, weeding, or uh, they are regarded worse at the, as the main condition of survival in the post-traumatic, post-apocalyptic community and as a power of regulation uh, over societal needs and uh, over the societal needs and values. Uh, in this concern, the focus of studying the implication of agricultural activities in nuclear fictional writings encourage us to address to the literary imaginaries of profiling permaculture, which is regarded not only as a set of agricultural gardening te te techniques, not as a, uh, or some kind of design and ecological sound way of living, but mainly as a thinking tool of uh, uh, for designing uh, uh, low carbon or uh, low carbon and highly productive uh, systems. Them, uh, systems. Permaculture is primary he, uh, here as a thinking full or um, uh, thinking full um, just between or, um, just as a tool between in, uh, individual elements. Uh, just bec uh, because those who uh, who are involved in uh, uh, in uh, surviving activities within uh, radiation contaminated area and uh, they appeal the protagonist appeal. Uh, to uh, in their agricultural activities appeal to permaculture ethics with uh, such uh, um, uh, with such component as earth care people care future care where care is a key component of uh, of the uh, key component of profiling the uh, of profiling the uh, agricultural activities Mm -hmm. uh, these steps of uh, narrating era traumatic experience and agricultural activ uh, activities in fictionalizing the Chernobyl disaster enhances the emotional component of nuclear of uh, Chernobyl narratives. The appeal to uh, the appeal to uh, permaculture contributes to emoting uh, terror trauma, which reveals such emotions uh, as uh, you can see: uh, sadness, worries, loss of unique nature, or, um, uh, ashamed of the way the area looks like, distress of forced displacement and others. But also uh, with appeal to agricultural practices within the damaged environment, radiation con contaminated environment in our ca uh, case, um, Agricultural activities encourage the shift from passive uh, experiencing of terror trauma to active experience of survival. This step allows to reconsider permaculture as a component of framing survival narrative for further reconsidering survival rhetorics in uh, rhetorics into sustainable um, sustainable li uh, living frame, leading to shaping critical societal uh, statement skills on sustainable living within energy-related frameworks. Mm -hmm. uh, such approach to studying the literary imaginaries, the literary imaginaries of uh, agricultural activities via terror traumatic experience in nuclear fiction, uh, in nuclear fictional writing, allows to reveal one more aspect: profiling agricultural activities as an act of resilience and healing in narrating terror trauma within energy-related post-traumatic uh, experience. 
uh, studying the literary dimension of situating care, physical, spiritual, uh, not only era, not only enables to frame agricultural activities as an act of resilience, as a tool of uh, self therapy, even eco therapy, uh, as a tool of self assessment in a context of zero trauma uh, experience. Uh, but also encourage, encourages profiling sustainable well-being in nuclear uh, storytelling. Um, fictionalizing, mm -hmm. uh, fictionalizing nuclear disaster, Chernobyl disaster in our case, uh, in this novel show that these stages of surviving, uh, of surviving uh, traumatic experience uh, launched by Glenn Elbrecht uh, uh, in this order, Euteria, Tierra Trauma, Celestalgia, goes through some transformations. Uh, just because protagonists, first of all, protagonists experience Tierra Trauma resulted from the nuclear disaster Aftermath. Then they experience celestalgia resulted from the forced uh, um, migration and the limits of their arrival back. And then they uh, uh, and after that they experience euteria, uh, which is uh, um, together with framing um, uh, permaculture ethics, uh, regarded as the uh, innovative framework for creating such ways uh, of uh, um, for creative uh, sustainable ways of uh, living within the. Um, within the radiation contaminated area and Fictionalizing your traumatic experience uh, in nuclear fiction writing show uh, just make some <coughs> make some uh, uh, allows us to come to such um, uh, to such um, uh, outcomes that in fiction in fiction uh, in uh, fictional writing uh, the um, uh, writers try to show uh, um, uh, to, uh, to show that, uh, to reframe their survival narrative, that survival is possible, the exclusion zone borders are transparent, which uh, shows as a, which result in weakening their apocalyptic rhetorics, as well as social engagement and uh, so, social engagement of uh, um, uh, social engagement in uh, um, uh, of um, a survival of uh, experience survival and uh, and later resilience uh, the second one that um, any fear the writer try to show that any fear uncertainty crisis can be regarded as a starting point uh, and really we can see that the protagonist experiencing distrust disappointment or nucleophobia or in our context is the chernobyl syndrome hatred together with curiosity and investigation what is the happening uh, how it can influence their or uh, their life they are just it can be only uh, the starting point of trans of switching from uh, from um, survival to uh, resilience na narrative. The third one, uh, the uh, um, mm -hmm, experiencing a distress of environmental of environmental changing together with mental, emotional, and spiritual health impact of environmental changing uh, helps to reconsider a sense of belonging not only to the place but to buyer system, which is was amazingly represented by your uh, researcher Patricia in your uh, in launching the concept on bias citizenship and the last one uh, these novel uh, these novels can be as uh, fictional writings on nuclear disaster can be regarded uh, on chernobyl disaster can be regarded as the um, tool of uh, as a tool of transmitting or uh, the transmitting the uh, um, nuclear uh, transmitting um, uh, no, uh, as uh, transmitting sustainable traditional agricultural knowledge to uh, as well as nuclear uh, nuclear scientific nuclear knowledge to the public. Um, yes, uh, living in the um, just with the dominating motives uh, on uh, on Chernobyl disaster. Ina, I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I should, uh, Can stop. you finish in two minutes? Is yes, that possible? It is Thank you. The last one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just we can. Uh, just we can. Uh, mm. Living. Uh, just we can. Sir, we can speak about that. Uh, uh, 
Uh, we, sp we can speak about the all the maybe we can speak about the all the emoting nuclear uh, nuclear energy in, in such uh, uh, in uh, this no uh, nuclear novels. But I try to regard the nuclear um, uh, the this nuclear fiction and the fictional dimensions of the traumatic experience as a tool of uh, transmitting nuclear knowledge to the public. And in our case, it is the nuclear, transmitting nuclear knowledge to uh, to young uh, to young um, adult children reading their uh, reading their novels. Thank you for just thank you for listening. Thank you for the time. Great, thank you very much. And we move on to the uh, fourth speaker in this panel, who is Jakub Wojcik. He's a Polish lawyer and Europeanist, graduate of the Law and Administration Faculty at the Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań and PhD candidate in Political Science at the Doctoral School of the Andrasi University in Budapest. He is focusing on right-wing extremist organizations in Central Eastern European transi transition states. Uh, he's also a graduate of the Global Campus of Human Rights. Um, he has also much professional experience as a lawyer at law firms in Warsaw and also as a scholar at the German Bundestag in Berlin, as a trainee at the European Commission in Brussels and at the Council of Europe uh, in Strasbourg. Um, he co-authored several articles, books and reports and his recent research focus is on ecocide and the ecocide genocide nexus. Uh, his latest article is ecocide, the genocide of the 21st century, question mark, Eastern European perspective, which was published by the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development in Belgrade. And he is also co-author of an emerging uh, book anthology of ecocide and Jakub will speak about the international penalization of ecocide environmental activism and critique of mainstream genocide studies thank you very much um, can you hear me yes uh, thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction i'm sorry for uh, being the last obstacle on your uh, way to lunch and um, uh, yes uh, also the discussion uh, one disclaimer, uh, I'm not a historian, as uh, you heard, um, only a lawyer, so forgive me any uh, shortcomings um, looking from your perspective as historians. Um, I'll be speaking about ecocide, and uh, I was kind of surprised that this term didn't occur in, pr in previous uh, speeches, but on the other hand, I'm very happy because I'll be able to, uh, to introduce it. Uh, so the structure of my presentation, I will uh, shortly introduce the concept of ecocide, um, present the early attempts um, to define the concept, uh, what were the main debates about the concept, um, different perspectives, how, how to uh, understand it, um, what are the current um, definitions, um, what were the first attempts to penalize ecocide internationally, and uh, the disappointing results of these attempts. Mm, then uh, I'll shortly speak about uh, national uh, penalization in several countries in their domestic um, penal codes. Um, I will give some short examples on, of ecocide, past and present, and um, we will think whether there are examples of uh, ecocide in Europe, maybe. Um, I will also mention uh, what is the nexus between ecocide and genocide. And I will focus in the end on the criticism uh, of uh, mainstream genocide studies and uh, the environmental activism. So moving on. Um, so uh, in the context of Vietnam War, when uh, the US Army used chemical weapons, uh, herbicides and uh, defoliants in Vietnam, Agent Orange, um, Professor uh, Arthur Goldstone um, coined this concept of ecocide uh, during a conference in Washington. Um, he, he was a, a professor of uh, plant biology and um, physiologist and bioethicist. Uh, he was mainly dealing with plants and he observed that uh, the results of uh, using um, 
uh, Agent Orange were disproportional to the, the goals of the army because the goal was to uh, somehow destroy the forest to uncover Viet Cong positions, but as a result, it also killed many uh, birds and fish and caused um, um, birth defects uh, in, in uh, some species. He made um, experiments on rats and he assumed that also people will suffer um, from, from the results of use of Agent Orange. Um, so first, such claims were made also by environmentalists. They were dismissed by the army saying these claims are unpatriotic, un-American, and uh, um, it's pacifist, and uh, you should not uh, speak about it. But then there was a lobby, not only uh, Professor Goldstone, but also other scientists, and in the end, Prof um, President Nixon decided uh, to stop using uh, those, those weapons. And uh, in 1972, uh, at the conference, uh, UN conference, Swedish uh, Prime Minister Olof Palme supported this idea um, of Professor Galston that ecocide, he again, again used this term, uh, should be uh, penalized, it should be a crime, international crime. And ecocide meant um, eco, so home, and sites means killing, so basically killing our home. And um, yeah, this is the early 70s when, when this term was uh, first used. And then the first definitions. So prof American professor uh, Richard Falk, uh, he drafted a convention uh, on the crime of ecocide. And um, his idea was that humanity can no longer afford uh, such actions that we basically destroy environment and there are people who benefit from it. And um, he defined ecocide as a means, any, um, ecocide means any of the following acts committed with intent uh, to disrupt or destroy in whole or in part a uh, human ecosystem to use um, the use of weapon of mass destruction, whether nuclear, uh, bacteriological, chemical or other, and the use of uh, chemical herbicides to um, uh, defoliate and um, uh, the forest, natural um, forest for military purposes, the use of bombs uh, and artillery in uh, such quantity, density uh, or size as to impair the quality uh, of soil or the, um, enhance the prospect of uh, diseases dangerous to human uh, beings and, uh, and so on. Um, so basically, um, it was in the context, still in the context of military actions, military, military purpose. And then, um, after many years, uh, British environmentalist and lawyer Polly Higgins uh, created much shorter, uh, simpler definition that ecocide is the extensive damage to, destruction of, or loss of ecosystems uh, of a given territory, whether by human agency or by other causes, uh, to such an extent that uh, peaceful enjoyment by the um, inhabitants uh, of the territory has been uh, severely uh, diminished. And uh, Polly Higgins is uh, no longer with us, but her two main messages uh, were that existing legal framework doesn't work. So for example, in, um, in industry, uh, companies calculate already uh, these damages into their budget and if they have to pay some compensation they are prepared for it so they, they just carry on with, with uh, business and, uh, and destruction. And uh, yes, the, the second message was that uh, we should somehow um, find a way to, to penalize uh, such actions. Mm, so nobody can just profit uh, from, from the destruction. And uh, the early debates in, um, in literature, in uh, political debate, legal debate, were around the concept, the definition of ecocide. Uh, should it be only in wartime or also in peacetime? So uh, damage caused by the army to the ecosystem or also by industry uh, during the peacetime? Should it be um, only uh, intentional action? Uh, or should also perpetrators be held accountable when they acted without any wrong intent, just by negligence or uh, without knowing the, the um, uh, collateral damage of their actions? Uh, it was also uh, an issue whether 
there should be harm to humans or in general to ecosystems, so to other species, not directly to humans. And finally, uh, should the perpetrators be state actors? I, I mean, the, who should be held accountable? Uh, state actors or also corporations um, or maybe m m CEO of the uh, corporation? So legal persons, natural persons, who should be exactly held accountable? And currently we have definitions. Uh, one is by the independent expert panel. Uh, it's ecocide, it's an unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a, a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. Uh, so there are some subjective elements here like long-term damage. What does it mean long-term? What does it mean widespread? And um, the other definition is in the European Commission's draft uh, of the new environmental crime directive. And uh, the draft was submitted to the European Parliament. Now it's in the process of trilogue between uh, Commission, Parliament and Council of the EU. Just two days ago, I think there was an announcement that the, the institutions agreed on the definition and also they want to penalize acts similar to ecocide. So, uh, to make it even broader. Uh, so you can read the, the definition here, but um, the main thing is that it's intentional, but also uh, if there is a serious negligence. And it's no longer about wartime, it's about uh, peacetime as well. So it's possibly a, a broad uh, definition. And uh, attempts to penalize ecocide internationally so UN level uh, 76, um, it was in the context of wartime, then European, um, sorry, International Law Commission, so expert body uh, of the UN, experts uh, dealing with uh, codification of international law. Um, 1978, and draft articles on state responsibility and international crime, and um, another um, body subcommission on prevention of discrimi um, discrimination and protection of uh, minorities. They also worked on that. The, the main point here is that the issue was basically tossed between different uh, committees, subcommittees, uh, councils, commissions, working groups, because nobody wanted to have responsibility or nobody had a like, political will to make any binding uh, decision on that. And um, yeah, there were some attempts also in the 80s, um, the discussion whether what's the character of ecocide intentional or not, still the same uh, issues after uh, years. Mm, and then 87 also to uh, in, extend uh, the definition. Mm. Um, finally, um, maybe the, the main point here is that uh, the issue was dropped in the 1996, and we don't know exactly why, because there is no official transcript, uh, no, no, no document about uh, why this was dropped. There was no voting, no decision, uh, just um, um, these, all these bodies that were working on just uh, drop it out of the agenda. Uh, what we know is the, some diplomats wrote in their diaries or memoirs that uh, there was pressure from um, nuclear power uh, states not to deal with this because they didn't want to be held accountable for the nuclear tests that they were making on the oceans and um, probably it was France and the UK and um, yeah um, so the topic basically finished in the 90s and there was another attempt it was not a UN body but International Criminal Court there was an attempt to um, introduce another crime next to genocide, war crimes, uh, war of aggression, and uh, crimes against uh, humanities to introduce ecocide, but it also failed. There was no separate uh, fifth crime. There was just mention of um, environmental crimes with widespread long-term and severe damage as a part of a war crime. So again, only again in a war context. So some countries were disappointed with this results and they penalized um, ecocide in their domestic uh, criminal codes. But as we can see, uh, these are not like uh, champions of uh, rule of law maybe, and uh, there are, there's some corruption also, oligarchy, um, 
so we don't have any examples that actually uh, ecocide was punished anywhere. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, there was one, one case, um, but the prosecution also was not successful. The, uh, the charges were dropped. So although since uh, 20 or 30 years these countries have the provisions, if they're criminal codes, they don't really uh, execute it. Uh, we have uh, global examples of ecocide. Uh, we'll not uh, go through all of them because we don't have time, but main thing is that they occur all over the world on all continents. They can be uh, through military actions or through industrial actions. Uh, there can be also accidents. So here again, question should accident be uh, treated as a crime or not because um, the person was not, did not have the intention to cause um, damage to environment. And uh, we can see that uh, this is mostly about coal mines, oil production, um, gold mines, copper mines, and um, so basically extra extraction of natural resources. And uh, we can see maybe one example, uh, draining of the Iraqi marshlands by Saddam Hussein in 1991. So it had political motives because Hussein wanted to get rid of um, people who lived in those uh, marshes. He perceived them as opposition or dissidents or some um, not really controllable element. Um, and he caused uh, this environmental uh, destruction and huge dis displacement of people. Around uh, half a million uh, Arabs uh, were on the move. But uh, it's also interesting for us here in Europe because uh, it caused um, disruption to the roots of birds who were normally flying from Africa to Europe and they were stopping there and eating uh, fish and going further, but then they couldn't, so either they went back or uh, chose other destinations. And because of that, we have uh, like millions of birds less uh, in Europe. Mm. One example is the Grasberg mine in, in Indonesia. So we can see huge uh, hole in the ground, uh, contamination of soil, groundwater, and um, if there are many such, such mines, uh, we can imagine how this affects the whole region. Also, Latin America, Ecuador, we have pollution of soil and uh, water by oil, oil. And the investor here was uh, Texaco Chevron, and there were um, a law um, disputes between the people living there and the company uh, for decades, and um, no result. So, um, Texaco is still uh, operating there. And do we have examples in Europe? Uh, well, again, we we'll, um, won't go through all the examples, but uh, there are historical ones, like the dam um, in Zaporizhia blown up by Russians uh, in the Second World War. We have um, the Białowieża primeval forest in Poland destroyed by the Nazis, and there was actually a trial in the first one. Um, it was uh, like site trial of the Nuremberg uh, trials. Uh, Aral Sea, man-made environmental crisis in uh, Soviet Union, Chernobyl, and um, other events. Uh, in the end, we see uh, the source global um, atlas of environmental justice selected examples. So basically, you can track um, the, the map um, of the world and see uh, all the spots uh, where um, you can spot an um, ecocide or a potential ecocide, how the situation is developing, what is the scale of the uh, situation, what's the danger, what kind of uh, risks. Mm, and you have some pictures over here. So again, Zaporozhnya um, um, Dam and the uh, RLC, how it uh, shrinked, and what's left. Mm, also the sh uh, sinking of the oil tanker next to Brittany. It was in 1999 and actually it brought the topic back in, in Europe because it, it was uh, quite a big event. Uh, uh, 30,000 of tons of oil um, went to, to water. And uh, the next one is uh, Hambach Lignit Kolmai. I've actually been there, I visited it like 10 years ago. And what you can see is under, um, until the horizon, you just see the, the coal mine and um, the works. And you can see the, hear, feel the vibration and hear the noise. 
and I um, talked to people who live there. Some of them had to be resettled and to, to other villages or cities um, because um, uh, the, the mine was growing and taking the, the new territories. And uh, you can see the satellite picture as well. And one interesting also uh, in Hungary, so um, alumnia sludge spill, the, the whole uh, ground was red, it was a toxic spill. So nothing will grow there also for years. And again, Novakachovka Dam, uh, so we started with Ukraine and we, we finished with Ukraine. The interesting thing is that uh, here, for example, President Zelensky said first that it was a terrorist attack or barbaric attack by terrorist state, but then he changed the narrative. He was uh, saying that it was an ecocide, crime of ecocide. And uh, we should remember that in Ukraine it's not only about this, but also the landmines that Russians are uh, leaving in the ground and uh, debris, like millions of of uh, missiles that um, contaminate the, the ground. And ecocide, um, genocide nexus, so basically we have two terms, uh, genocide with, uh, which was um, coined by Rafael Lemkin, and it's about destruction of the groups of people um, based on several uh, um, grounds, national, ethnic, racial, and so on. And uh, ecocide is a destruction of um, ecosystem but it, it can harm uh, different species. So we can already see that these two terms can overlap when, um, for example, we commit genocide, but in the process we, um, we also destroy a land on which the people um, are living, or when we commit ecocide, this, we destroy the environment and then we so kill the people who, uh, who live there. Uh, we can give an example of um, Native Americans, for example. There were documents of American army saying that uh, we should uh, kill the, the bisons because then in this way we can uh, get rid of the, the Indians, the, the Native Americans, because then they will have no food. And um, yeah, so basically through killing of animals, they wanted to get rid of the people. Mm, and here we touch upon one issue that um, ecocides basically affect the uh, indigenous people mostly. Uh, criticisms of mainstream genocide studies. So uh, here, uh, just um, coming to, to an end slowly, that basically the, the main argument of the crit critics is that uh, genocide is an anthropocentric idea. It's only about harming people. And it neglects other, other species, uh, other perspectives, like uh, ecocentric or, or uh, biocentric perspectives. And um, it doesn't protect all groups. Um, and uh, the critics say that it's a col um, colonial, neoliberal uh, approach, and uh, they, sh they would like to reintroduce the original idea of Lemkin, who said uh, firstly that um, genocide is not about killing people like physical extermination, but it's broader term based on his earlier works on uh, barbarism and uh, vandalism. Um, so basically also destruction of culture, destruction of, of environment where the people are living. Um, and uh, these people who, who criticize the mainstream genocide studies are perceived as uh, deep green or anarchists, uh, mostly by the conservative uh, scholars. Um, the critics uh, present this ecological paradigm, yes, um, and advocate for more environmental approach to, to genocide combined with uh, environmental also aspects. And uh, final, um, final slide on environmental activism. Uh, so basically what we see from the data, it's mostly in uh, Latin America where protesters are actually being uh, killed um, during the protests by the police or army. And uh, sometimes um, the, um, the issue is politicized also. Uh, we can have an example of Azerbaijan, Armenia. So we can see one, on the one side protests sponsored by the government, uh, the, the environmentalists protest against Armenia, who in their opinion uh, destroyed the environment. On, on the other hand, we see genuine Azeri protesters protesting against the government and operation of the uh, mine, and then Azeri police is dispersing those, uh, those protests. And finally, just a couple of weeks ago, there was an incident in Panama. And, um, one man shot a protester, two protesters, um, during a protest against uh, the mine. 
um, I think it's uh, important, um, it's for the future, uh, to remember that we should, uh, talking about environmental protests, to distinguish between climate change protests and ecocide protesters, because uh, climate change protesters, it's a, more like a global movement. It's against emissions um, and so on, while changing the policies of government, while uh, ecocide protesters are more local. It's more like about um, uh, indigenous people protesting about harm that is going on to their close environment in, in their, their space where they are living. And uh, there are some ideas how to deal with ecocide. So one is to introduce this as a crime to international uh, criminal courts, so the Rome status alongside um, genocides, war crimes, and so on. And other ideas is to create specialized court, environmental crime court. But for that, we should also educate lawyers um, because now we have either environmental lawyers or criminal lawyers, and there's a gap between these two disciplines. So we should somehow bridge the gap and um, educate lawyers specializing in both these disciplines. Um, yeah, so that's the end. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to have questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all our speakers. We'll still have some 15 minutes for discussion. Um, we had here presentations about various discourses on uh, environmental and the nuclear crisis. And uh, these discourses have various agents and media. And also uh, what, what was presented in all presentations were the various scales uh, from local uh, through transnational to towards global and regional and uh, traveling memories. I hope that there will be time to talk about it uh, as well. Uh, we had individual and institutional memories and trauma and silence and dealing uh, with them, working on them and activism, memory activism as a counter uh, acting to, to these uh, phenomena. Uh, I will not continue on my comments now because uh, I am sure there are many questions uh, from the audience. So the floor is open and the first question. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Camila. I'm a researcher from Kazakhstan, and my first uh, I have two questions. I'll have one for uh, Ms. Ardak and Alexandra. Uh, to Ardak, I would maybe give a very short comment and then proceed to a question, but I'll try to be... Um, the important part of, I think, top-down memory, and also you've mentioned a lot about Karibek Kuyupov, uh, the painter, right, and his works as the prominent symbolism of uh, semi-polygon catastrophe. At the same time, how do you see the bottom up, the bottom up memory emerged, and those untold stories being told in the future. Because most people who still live on the side in East Kazakhstan, they are constantly being interviewed. So, I think it was a month ago, right, the day of remembrance against nuclear disarmament, International Day. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, that this day was a few months ago. And on this day, those people usually are interviewed a lot, and they you can feel the exhaustion of people from, like, wh where's the ethics? Where do we talk about the ethics of trying to commemorate and tell the stories which Soviet government and also current independent Kazakhstan did not tell us? How can we continue talking about this? Like, how can we unsilence what has been silenced? And my second question uh, is to uh, Dr. Pulur Maher. Um, you mentioned about liquidators. And as far as I understood, most of them are from the Ukraine, right? Uh, no, how do you see, yeah, maybe this is what has been said about transnationalism as well. How do you see the, there are limitations, but to what extent the liquidators across the former Soviet Union were interviewed, or maybe do you plan interviewing them? Because when we go back to like our countries, which were part of Soviet Union, for example, in my neighborhood, there were three or four men which were in Chernobyl back then, and they were never talking about that. Um, how do you see the future of, once again, making these people's memories being revealed? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. I think it is a very sensitive uh, topic, uh, and uh, many people um, decided not to uh, tell about the 
health problems in the east of Kazakhstan and not on the east of Kazakhstan because many regions in Kazakhstan and Russia and uh, are suffer, will suffer it from this nuclear uh, test site in Semipalatinsk. I think that uh, the, it is not um, right that uh, we are not have so many uh, demonstrations in Kazakhstan also about our Semipalatinsk nuclear test site and that's why I represented my presentation today because we good know about the situation in Chernobyl in Ukraine. It is very widespread information for whole the world. But uh, it is very hard uh, to people uh, to discuss on this uh, sensitive topic. And uh, I mentioned in my presentation about the law system in Kazakhstan, about uh, the compensation to people. Of course, I uh, understand that uh, the Kazakhstan government and I think that the Russian government also have to uh, give compensation to people because it is, was the Moscow, the center of Soviet Union, and they uh, have to do many things for people who are suffering uh, from a simple nuclear test site. And uh, I think that uh, activists uh, tried uh, to do on this topic many things. But of course, it's a very sensitive topic when we uh, talk about our health, about our environment, about ecological. But uh, I have hope that many people, and uh, first, in the first, uh, it is very important that people from Kazakhstan have to represent this theme uh, in the world because uh, we know very well the situation and uh, we will have problems with health. And I also have problems with health. And future generations in this place uh, will have problems. And uh, we need uh, to speak on this theme, uh, many uh, words and uh, try to uh, get our situations better to help people uh, in this uh, situation. Thank you very much. Can I just quickly mention one book which I think we should uh, mention when we talk about Semi Polygon by Torjan Kasenova? Atomic Step. I don't know if some of you have heard of that. It is, I think, available online and was translated to Kazakh. Atomic Step. How Kazakhstan gave up nuclear bomb by Dr. Torjan Kasenova. She and I think her father, Umer Sirk Kasenova, has worked a lot on nuclear disarmament in Kazakhstan, which I think very coincides with what Ardak, you said about there should be people from Kazakhstan telling about this. Otherwise, who would do that? Yeah. Uh, concerning your question, thank you very much. Um, I have to admit I'm not, uh, or um, Chernobyl is not my focus um, concerning research. I'm rather into Second World War, but I know that there are people who are taking interviews. I think um, it would be necessary to process them. But um, uh, concerning Chernobyl, I think there is a lot of memory, even these um, HBO series, many, many other movies, so um, there uh, you find a lot of, and also if there is this um, day, the 26th of April, if there are anniversaries, uh, I think um, people talk about that. But um, on the other hand, I think therefore these um, interviews of um, Alexeyevich are so important. These individual memories of people who are maybe are ashamed of talking about all these uh, things, uh, I think they are very important um, and it is necessary to find somebody who is able to conduct such interviews because it's really very difficult. Actually, um, Alexeyevich uh, calls them monologues but because he, she uh, has these people just talk and um, they give very different reactions. They, some are silent, others are screaming, some are, uh, yeah, as a very difficult reactions. Um, if you read her book, um, you, you find out how traumatized these people are still, and that uh, for them it's not over. And there's still this fear um, of getting sick, of having people, relatives dying, of having relatives uh, getting sick, um, people, mothers who are traveling around hospitals with their children, actually living there uh, because they are so sick, um, then misformed 
children, uh, dying children, children who are um, talking of dying and of death, and uh, it's it's a very uh, depressing um, uh, environment actually. Uh, this people of uh, Chernobyl, and um, yeah, so I I hope there will be more uh, research on this. And um, the problem is also that I think that um, in the former countries of the Soviet Union. Um, these people are not honored that much anymore, or differently. I read about uh, Putin honoring people, but cutting and limiting uh, the support, the medical support. Uh, so he, for example, honored a pilot who uh, flew uh, and uh, spread silver ionite uh, to make clouds rain down on Belarus to prevent these clouds uh, raining down on Moscow. Um, I'm not sure. Ah, okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. So um, yeah, it uh, is a topic still. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry to be so brutal, but we actually would like to have lunch in five minutes. But uh, please uh, ask your questions. We will collect them. Thank you. Um, does this work? Yes, I think so. Uh, Ina, I wanted to ask a question. Thank you for your for your fantastic presentation. I really liked the way that you, <clears throat> on the basis of what seems to be quite a large corpus of of literary text, how you how you engage with these um, um, environmental concerns that are brought up in these uh, in these uh, in this type of literature. I, you said something about uh, the fictional aspect uh, of these books, which is also something that they emphasize themselves. Um, I wonder to what extent that fictionalization actually goes. Is it that we are dealing with fictional characters, with fictional plot lines, or are we also dealing with fictionalized histories or alternative histories of what, what, what actually happened in Chernobyl? So I, I wondered if you could comment on, on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, sorry, Even sorry, Ina. Uh, we ah. will collect another question and then I okay. will ask you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hello, so the question is for uh, Jakub Wojcik. Uh, I was wondering, uh, can... Um, and, um, how is it called? Uh, can the uh, meat uh, and the dairy industry uh, be considered as uh, ecocide? Okay, and now uh, we will have the two answers, Ina and Jakub. Is it my turn? Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you for your question. And actually, um, yes, I can say that uh, um, Chernobyl fiction can be regarded as the amalgamation of factual and uh, fictional narratives. Yes, and on one hand, such amalgamation, uh, such combination, amalgamation of these narratives um, blur the line between faction, factual and fictional and encourage readers to uh, to reconsider the fic the fictional story to the fictional uh, um, uh, plot as the uh, fictional one and uh, on one hand it gets uh, uh, it uh, results in over emoting nuclear uh, nuclear uh, over emoting the factual or uh, the factual data but on the other hand i guess and i have just mentioned in presentation that uh, i um, uh, try to consider uh, just and um, I guess the, just some of the writers of this no the authors of this novel support me uh, in these ideas that the uh, first of all the are novels. I'd like to focus your attention that these novels written by North American writers for Anglophone readers, uh, uh, young, uh, just young children, and their idea was actually to provide the uh, to provide the uh, in fictional way to provide the information on the uh, one of the event uh, of nuclear history of the humanity. They try to cover the event which happened somewhere in the Soviet Ukraine on other continent and uh, in and not only provide the information on the event happening somewhere here. Uh, 
Yes, sometimes with the dominating motives was of victimization, even monsterization. But actually, their task was to uh, try to encourage readers to reflect the, uh, their um, nuclear knowledge, uh, nuclear policy, um, nuclear industry issues in to their uh, to their um, North American context. And that's why, in uh, just and from this perspective, I guess that we can consider. Uh, nuclear fictional writing including chernobyl fiction as a way of uh, as a way of um, uh, transmitting knowledge to the public yes it is other story how what is the difference between the ukrainian belarusian uh, writers and north american writers uh, in the uh, depicting the chernobyl disaster and other functions but it is uh, within this presentation i do that in uh, other events Thanks very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question about meat industry. Uh, I can say uh, three things here. First of all, uh, in literature, I can see it's mostly about, uh, mostly about extraction uh, industry, so coal mines, gold mines, and so on. It's not really about meat industry, but it doesn't mean uh, it cannot be. The thing is uh, whether uh, it causes the damage to ecosystem, and then whether it meets the requirements set out in the definition. Uh, so whether this destruction is widespread, whether it's uh, very serious and uh, long term. And um, I don't know, is meat industry meeting those um, criteria or not? Uh, is it destroying ecosystem in, in these three um, elements? Uh, this is the, the question we have to answer. And finally, uh, Professor Philippe Sand also said interesting thing, is one of the experts who, who uh, worked on the final definition that we have now, um, that uh, when we look for perpetrators, so whether it's some specific company, maybe meat industry company or some other company, uh, it's up to always activists and journalists to to find those perpetrators, describe their activities, and uh, um, like argue whether they commit this ecocide or not. And it's not necessarily now to lawyers or experts or uh, lobbyists um, who work on penalization and to to point fingers at specific industries or corporations because they don't want to make any enemies among the the players and uh, they just want to operate in abstract terms um, until we have it uh, penalized and then we go for the perpetrators and first if we already uh, define the perpetrators they may try to block uh, the process of penalization so maybe it's too early to for lawyers and experts to say about mid industry, but it's totally up to academia or journalists or activists to to say that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot to all the panelists uh, again, and I think it was a great section uh, session. Um, now we will uh, go to lunch break. We have forty five minutes. And at 15 to 3, we will follow with a roundtable discussion. Thanks again.